Institutes. So today we're very happy to highlight two of the student recipients of CAG Awards who will be each presenting in the webinar today. So they'll each have about 20 minutes and then we will have questions and comments and discussion at the end. Just so you know, you're welcome to post any questions or comments as the speakers are talking in the chat room, but you won't be able to um, turn your microphone on. So you'll need to post things in the chat room and we can address things at the end of the session. So first we're going to have Daniel, Danielle D'Amico um, present. Danielle is the recipient of the CAG Donald Menzies Bursary. And she is a PhD student in psychological sciences at X University, formerly named Ryerson University. And she is a trainee through the Canadian Consortium on Neuro Neurodegeneration in Aging. So using epidemiological methods, Danielle's research focuses on life course risk and protective factors for cognitive decline with a particular focus on chronic stress and lifestyle behaviors. Danielle is also interested and actively engaged in knowledge translation and community outreach. So welcome, Danielle. Thank you for um, being in part of our webinar today. And please feel free to go ahead with your presentation. Perfect. Thank you. And I apologize if anyone hears my dog barking in the background. She has impeccable timing. <laughs> okay. And you can see my screen, right? <clears throat> Yes, it looks great, Danielle. Okay, yeah. perfect. We'll get started. Um, so <clears throat> my name is Danielle D'Amico. As Lori mentioned, I'm a PhD student at X University, the designation for what was formerly known as Ryerson and soon to be renamed. And so today I will be presenting findings from a project titled Early Life Adversity and Cognitive Function in Middle-Aged and Older Adults, Mediating Role of Allostatic Load. And so just to give an overview of what I will be discussing, so I'll start with some background information on the topic, specifically around stress and cognitive function, the biological embedding of early life adversity and the allostatic load framework. And then this will bring me to the current study objectives and hypotheses as well as the methodology for the study, the results. And um, I'll finish by discussing the findings and some possible implications. Okay, so what I'm sure is really well known to everyone on this call, um, an ample body of research shows that preserving cognitive function across the lifespan is associated with enhanced well being and quality of life with aging, uh, maintaining autonomy and functional independence, as well as having a lower risk of developing dementia or any sort of cognitive impairment. And so this makes it crucial for us to understand the factors that interact across the lifespan to facilitate healthy cognitive aging, especially factors that are modifiable in nature. And so among the various modifiable factors that contribute to variation in cognition, chronic stress is one such risk factor that can be detrimental to cognitive function. And although chronic stress can be harmful across all stages uh, across the life course, Early life, so it's refer, uh, referring to infancy, childhood, and adolescence, is a period where the nervous system is particularly sensitive to the effects of stress. And this has been demonstrated in research showing that higher levels of stress in early life, especially, especially experiences that are traumatic in nature, such as neglect, maltreatment, and abuse, are associated with poor cognitive function in adulthood, faster rates of cognitive decline over time, and an increased risk of developing dementia. And although the mechanism through which early life adversity impacts cognition in adulthood is unclear at the moment, it may be explained by the biological embedding of childhood adversity model. And this model suggests that when adversity occurs during sensitive development, developmental windows, it calibrates how physiological systems operate throughout the life course. And this is especially true for the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal or HPA axis for short, which is the body's primary stress response system. And if the HPA axis is chronically activated during development, this can lead to dysregulation in adulthood. And this um, can proliferate across the lifespan and impact cognition by shaping responses to stress in adulthood, as well as leading to wear and tear of other physiological systems in the body. And so for example, um, this idea has been shown in previous studies 
which have found that higher levels of early life adversity are associated with poor cog uh, global cognitive function in adulthood through higher levels of self-reported emotional stress reactivity in adulthood. And as well, another study showed um, that the relationship between higher levels of early life adversity and poor adulthood cognition is mediated by plasma interleukin-6, and this is a marker of enhanced inflammation in the body. And although these two studies offer insight into the mechanisms through which early life adversity impacts cognition, they don't really capture the multi-system dysregulation from stress that is key for negative health outcomes to emerge. And so the mechanism may be better explained by using the allostatic load framework. And this refers uh, directly to multi-system dysregulation due to uh, cumulative wear and tear from chronic stress. And so essentially um, what this model suggests is that chronic activation of the body's uh, stress response systems or the primary mediators eventually lead to dysregulation of other systems in the body, including the immune system, the metabolic system, and the cardiovascular system, otherwise known as secondary mediators. And then the imbalance of these interconnected systems ultimately can result in allostatic load, which can accumulate and lead to adverse effects on the brain and the body, otherwise known as tertiary outcomes. And so previous studies have shown that higher levels of early life adversity are associated with higher allostatic load in adulthood, even after accounting for stress experienced in adulthood. And research has also shown that higher levels of allostatic load are associated with poor cognitive function across the adult lifespan. And this suggests that allostatic load may be a possible mechanism through which early life adversity impacts cognition. And prior research has also shown that allostatic load mediates the relationship between early life adversity and cognitive function in adolescents and young adults, as well as the relationship between early life adversity and multimorbidity among older adults. But no research to date that we are aware of has directly examined cognitive function in middle-aged and older adulthood as an outcome measure in this model. And so the objective of the current study was to examine if allostatic load mediates the relationship between early life adversity and cognitive function among middle-aged and older adults. And it was hypothesized that allostatic load would be a mediator such that greater levels of early life adversity would lead to higher allostatic load, which would in turn lead to poorer cognitive function. And then we also explored whether this possible mediation differed by sex and whether the mediation was driven by specific physiological subsystems of allostatic load that I showed before. So the neuroendocrine system, the immune system, the metabolic system, or the cardiovascular system. And to do this, we use cross-sectional data from the midlife in the United States or the MIDAS study, which um, of those who aren't familiar with this study is an investigation of the biological, psychological, social, and behavioral determinants of physical and me mental and cognitive health in middle and late life. And so for this specific study, we combine data from two MIDAS cohorts, um, the MIDAS II cohort conducted in 2004 to 2006, and the MIDAS refresher cohort um, conducted in 2011. And um, just to clarify, these are two separate groups of participants that received identical data collection at two different time points, and they're not longitudinal assessments of the same people over time. And the MIDA study has initiated several subprojects to allow for more detailed examination of specific study objectives. And we took data from both cohorts from those who participated in the cognitive project, um, which entailed a thorough cognitive assessment as well as those who participated in the biomarker project, which entailed a detailed blood and urine collection, a physiological examination, and questionnaires about childhood adversity. And because some participants only completed uh, one project but not the other, we only selected those who participated in both projects. And then we further removed individuals who met our exclusion criteria, and this includes self-reports of a neurological disorder, Parkinson's disease, a history of stroke, a history of serious head injury, and having previously undergone chemotherapy or radiation treatment. 
And then lastly, we removed individuals who are missing key demographic variables like age, sex, education, and ethnicity, as well as those who are missing data on the primary variables of interest. And this resulted in a final analytical sample of 1,541 participants. And so in terms of measures, early life adversity was, measure, was measured using the childhood trauma questionnaire. And this is a 25 item standardized questionnaire inquiring about physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, as well as physical um, and emotional neglect in early life, including childhood um, and adolescence. And then to measure allostatic load, a total of 20 blood, urinary, and anthropomorphic biomarkers were collected. And each of these biomarkers listed here are categorized into the four physiological systems that comprise allostatic load. And then to measure cognition, the brief test of adult uh, cognition by telephone was used. And this consists of seven standardized neurological tasks, two of which correspond to episodic memory and five of which correspond to executive functions. So working memory, verbal fluency, inductive reasoning, processing speed and attention switching. And then we also extracted sociodemographic health and brief lifestyle data um, for covariate purposes and to describe the sample. And then in terms of statistical analyses, the early life adversity um, was calculated using the total CTQ score ranging from zero to 15, with higher scores reflecting more early life adversity. And the allostatic load index was calculated by dichotomizing um, each of the 20 biomarkers into sex stratified high risk quartiles, and then summing them for a total score ranging from zero to 20, with higher scores indicating a greater allostatic load. And then the cognitive composite scores uh, were calculated by summing the z-scores for each task under episodic memory, executive function, and then all of them together uh, for global cognition. And finally, three primary mediation models were conducted using process macro um, to calculate the direct and indirect or the mediating effect of allostatic load. And we ran each model twice. So first, a partially adjusted model controlling for age, educational attainment, and ethnicity, and then a second uh, model further controlling for lifestyle factors, including physical activity, smoking, and alcohol intake. And so just to give an overview of the sample characteristics, um, so the uh, age range from 25 to 84 with an average age of about 53. About 53% of the sample was female. And over 80% of the sample identified as white with the rest of the sample identifying as either Black, Asian, Native American, or Alaska Native Aleutian Islander, Eskimo, or other, which includes those who identified as mixed ethnicity. And the range in CTQ scores uh, varied from the lowest possible score of zero to the highest possible score of 15, with an average score of 2.4, which indicates relatively low levels of early life adversity overall. And the average total allostatic load score was also relatively low at five, with scores ranging from zero to 16 out of a possible 20. And so when looking at the mediating role of allostatic load in the relationship between early life adversity and global cognition, controlling only for age, education, and ethnicity, there was a statistically significant indirect effect of allostatic load in the relationship down here in bold. And the model accounted for 32% of the variance in global cognition. And then when further adjusting this model for physical activity, smoking and alcohol intake, the indirect effect of all allostatic load remains statistically significant and accounted for 30% of the variance in global cognition. And then moving on to episodic memory as the outcome measure. So we did not find an indirect effect of allostatic load in the relationship between early life adversity and episodic memory when controlling for age, education, and ethnicity. And the model accounted for 14% of the variance in episodic memory. And then again, when further controlling this model for physical activity, smoking, and alcohol intake, the indirect effect remains statistically non-significant with 12% of the variance in episodic memory uh, being accounted for by the model. 
And then finally, when controlling for age, education, and ethnicity again, a statistically significant indirect effect of allostatic load was found in the relationship between early life adversity and executive function. And this accounted for 29% of the variance in executive function. And then um, similar to the other two models, when controlling for physical activity, smoking and alcohol intake, we uh, the significant statistically significant effect uh, remained and the model accounted for 28% of the variance in executive function. And so next we conducted the same models as previously shown, but this time we stratified them by sex um, to determine if this mediate, mediating effect differed by sex. And so um, for global cognition, we did not see an indirect effect of allostatic load for males or females and the partially adjusted models for global cognition or episodic memory. And when stratifying the executive function model, we did find a significant indirect effect of allostatic load for females, but not males. Um, but when controlling for physical activity, smoking and alcohol intake, this effect was no longer statistically significant. And so next we explored the mediating role of the four physiological subsystems of allostatic load, starting with the neuroendocrine system. And we did not find an indirect effect of the neuroendocrine subsystem in the relationship uh, for any of the models, global cognition, episodic memory, and executive function. And for the immune subsystem, we did find an indirect effect for both global cognition and executive function in the partially adjusted models. But when we ad further adjusted for the lifestyle factors, this indirect effect was no longer found. And then for the cardiovascular subsystem, we found no indirect effect for any of the models. And finally, for the metabolic system, we found an indirect effect for both global cognition and executive function in the partially adjusted models controlling for demographic variables. And these effects actually remained after further controlling for lifestyle factors, indicating that the metabolic subsystem mediates the relationship between early life adversity and both global cognition and executive function. And so just to summarize the key study findings, so we found that allostatic load mediated the relationship between early life adversity and both global cognition and executive function, such that greater early life adversity was associated with higher allostatic load and higher allostatic load was associated with worse cognitive performance. And we did not find evidence that allostatic load mediated the relationship between early life adversity and episodic memory. And exploratory analyses did not find differential mediating effects uh, by allostatic, of allostatic load by sex when adjusting for the lifestyle factors. And finally, we found that the mediating role of allostatic load may be driven by the metabolic system. And so overall, the findings support the theory that early life adversity becomes biologically embedded over time, which can negatively impact downstream health outcomes in middle-aged and older adulthood. And the findings are also consistent with previous research in adolescents and younger adults, which have shown the same mediating role of allostatic load. And the current study adds to this body of work by supporting the idea of cognitive aging as a lifelong developmental process that is anchored in early experiences and extends across the lifespan. And further, the results suggest that early life adversity may impact cognition via allostatic load in a, a domain specific manner, such that allostatic load was found to mediate the relationship between early life adversity and executive function, but not episodic memory. And so this is consistent with the frontal lobe hypothesis of aging, which suggests that cognitively intact older adults show a disproportionate age related changes to the prefrontal cortex, while generally preserving functioning in non frontal regions. And um, this is relevant for the current sample, which was not cognitively impaired and generally performed well on the cognitive tasks. And we also found evidence that the mediating role of allostatic load may be driven by the metabolic subsystem when adjusting for lifestyle factors. And so prior work in our lab has shown that metabolic markers comprising allostatic load are more predictive of cognitive function 
compared with other physiological systems. And this may be due to the fact that the secondary mediators in the, in the model extend, for, extend um, from wear and tear of the primary mediators and therefore reflect more extensive physiological dysregulation and may have greater predictive value. Um, but it is important to note that the indirect effect estimate, so this mediating um, estimate for the metabolic subsystem was about half that of the total allostatic load score. And this suggests that even though the metabolic subsystem may be driving this effect, considering all of the systems accounts for a larger proportion of this mediation. And so when controlling for lifestyle factors, we also found no effect modification by sex, although females did report greater early life adversity compared to males in our sample. And this null effect modification by sex uh, con contrasts with a previous study examining multimorbidity as an outcome measure. And the study showed that the mediating role of allostatic load was stronger in females. Um, but it's very difficult to compare directly to this study because the sample size was much larger and the outcome variable, of course, was different. And in the uh, fully adjusted primary mediation models, about 70 to 75% of the variance in cognitive function was unaccounted for. And this may be explained by other lifestyle factors that were not included in the current study, such as social engagement, social support, as well as dietary intake. And so this um, suggests that in, uh, prevention-based interventions that reduce allostatic load before negative health outcomes surface should be investigated further. And then in terms of study limitations, so first the study design was cross-sectional and this prevents causal relationships from being established. Um, however, early life adversity theoretically occur occurs decades before cumulative deficits show up and um, before cognitive outcomes in later years. Um, however, participants with poor cognitive form performance may be less accurate in recalling and reporting retrospective events from childhood. And then further, the observed effects um, may have been underestimated due to the characteristics of the study sample in that participants reported relatively low levels of early life adversity overall, and also had on average relatively low allostatic load scores. And then finally, the limited sample size when stratifying the models by, by sex may have um, influenced the null exploratory sex specific findings. And so to conclude, the study suggests that early life adversity is consequential for poor cognitive function across the adult lifespan. And this may be biologically embedded through physiological dysregulation due to chronic stress. And this work highlights the importance of targeting early life as a critical window for prevention and intervention that sets the tone for healthy aging. And future work is needed to understand resilience factors that both reduce allostatic load directly and buffer the effects of early life adversity on cognitive function. And in order to succeed in this, a transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary collaboration um, is important across scientists, healthcare providers, policymakers, and individuals with lived experience. And so with that, I want to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Alexandra Fioco, as well as Maya Amastoy. This, uh, she's a grad student at the University of Toronto Scarborough, and she conducted this study with me. And I'd also like to acknowledge the MIDA study staff, the funding support for, uh, for the MIDA study, and then my own research support as well. Hey, thank you very much, Danielle, um, for that great presentation. There's a chat room and you're more than welcome to include any questions or comments you have for Danielle in the chat room and hopefully we'll have some time at the end after the next presentation to address some of those. So Laura, you're welcome to get your slides sharing if you're able to there. So Laura Pinchbeck is our next presenter and she's the recipient of the Marjorie Boyce bursary um, that the CAG offers. Laura is a PhD scholar in human ecology in the design and material culture program in human ecology in the Faculty of Agriculture, Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Alberta. She has degrees in material culture and architecture. And I like in her um, signature for, of her um, email, she calls herself a researcher, designer, facilitator, evaluator, and dreamer. 
So welcome, um, Lara, and you're welcome to start your presentation. Thank you, but I just want to check that you yeah. can, now you can see my fancy slide, right? Yeah, that looks great. We can Perfect. see your slides, great. Okay, yeah. I'm going to minimize all of you folks so I don't see myself talking. Good day. Um, my name is Lara Pinchbeck. I'm coming to you today from Miskwichiwa Skykan, which are the traditional lands of many Indigenous peoples denoted in Treaty 6. Colonially, this place is known as Edmonton in Alberta. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about um, some examples that I'm pulling from uh, my data collection that I'm undertaking currently that help inform a bigger question that I have uh, that's part of um, the design culture that we have or design processes in general. So who am I? Well, I think of myself as a compound person. Um, I Currently, I would say I'm a human-centered designer with a background in architecture, but I'm also a person who has lived experiences of disabilities, mostly invisible ones. I work with designers, planners, developers, project managers, facility operators, multitude of different people to help guide design processes that they may use to be able to create both social and physical environments that are ultimately more inclusive. So I'm currently, as was mentioned, undertaking my doctorate research in um, human ecology. It's a, it's a field or a discipline, I guess I would say, that seems to uh, provide a, a holistic perspective to understand what daily living experiences are like. And I'm part of a research team under the direction of Dr. Megan Strickfadden. And we explore relationships between material environments, all the objects that are in them, the way they're constructed, how they function, environmental factors that impact them, and the people who are occupying them who live with disabilities. So we want to understand how the, the environment affords or inhibits somebody from being able to live their life as they envision. I'm also a researcher in resident. I'm three years into a four-year project with an, a community organization where they ha have decided to undertake, I want to say, a renaissance of their organization. So I was involved in the pre-design work, then the design work, um, construction is underway, and now in the last month we've moved the first wave of folks into uh, a new facility renovated facility and a new facility. There's two components to it that are um, traditionally known as mem memory care facilities for older adults here in Edmonton. Um, this is also what's interesting that we didn't predict in the project. We, we as in the organization themselves, is this um, process is actually affording them as well the opportunity to take a look at uh, their organizational culture and see how they can shift it. So. Uh, this was, this was a, a, an outcome that had not been predicted at the beginning of the project, but I'm not going to talk about that so much. But what I do want to talk about is that um, overall, when we do our work as part of our research team, we want to be able to get a baseline understanding of what can seem like really abstract concepts uh, for people, because we want to be able to use those not only as understandings of that individual's lived experience and their perspective, but we ultimately want to use those to both inform the design process um, and then later the programming and curation and animation of that space. Uh, but we also want to be able to use that to evaluate how successful those environments are. So these abstract concepts can include things like home, comfort, safety, joy, beauty, often things that um, may be ch both challenging to describe, but also unique to individuals. So I look, because I have a design background and um, I want to, ultimately I want to see that our world can be as inclusive as possible. I see that designers play a role as professionals in this, in this as a responsibility. And so I'm specifically looking at uh, different components and different factors of the decision-making process how, in the design process um, for folks that are, that are constructing 
or animating or programming or altering their daily living environments. And so I look at these design decisions, not only to find out who's making them, um, but also what information is being used in this process. And I want to see how the information about individuals' lived experiences, their daily life is actually translated into design. So I'm going to take you through um, a couple of examples, well, more than a couple, but a handful of examples that are individual ones that I've pulled out of uh, some of the data collection that I've been doing for this project over the last couple of years, and just talk um, a little bit about what it is that I've learned about how decision making is happening in this particular context. And I'm not at a point yet where I've been analyzing these specifically. So these are really top of mind thoughts at this particular moment. So who am I working with? So these are, this is a, a congregate living community where there's approximately uh, in this first phase that's moved in, there's about 20 residents. Um, they live in a larger community where there are about say 200 people in the anticipatory phase before, before they would move into this, um, this curated location. Most of the people are, I'd say average age 85 years old. Uh, they live with moderate to advanced dementia. Most of them have significant cognitive decline with additional communications challenges. Um, they would also have additional lived experiences that are related to aging. So they could have hearing loss, stability and balance issues, movement challenges, issues with dexterity that could affect their daily living activities like eating and dressing and personal care. So let's start looking at some of these examples. So this is, uh, these are all photos from the, from the process itself, or at different phases of the process. So this would be a typical scenario that, that um, most design projects might experience. This is a design charade. It was organized by the design team themselves. So the architects and the interior designers, they would invite people to participate in it. In this case, it was about brainstorming different room, possible room configurations given limitations of size of uh, possible room layouts for bedrooms, for the suites, for the bedrooms. So usually the people who are invited tend to be management or representatives of the users or clients. The materials that we're working with here uh, tend to be abstracted representations of the spaces. So they could be manipulatives that are both um, abstracted in terms of their actual configuration. And they're also done to scale. So it's not life size by any means. What happens in this particular regard is we're seeing that information is filtered through people who are both able-bodied and able-minded. And the discussion was noting that they were bringing their own personal lens to the conversation um, and no, challenged in, in actually being able to accu accurately represent what um, somebody who ultimately will be a user of that space will experience. So this is the, this is the photograph that's associated with the title of the, this presentation. So one day last month after um, we had moved in and I was sitting down beside one of the residents, I, we were talking about many things and, um, and carry on different kinds of conversations. And this was the wall, this was our view. We were looking across at this particular wall. And she basically said to me, after a small pause with a puzzled look, she said, so who picked these colors anyway? And then started to tell me about the fact that, you know, fine, these colors were bright and she can understand, um, you know, why, why somebody would have chosen them, but she wasn't sure about the, the large um, use of them, the large scale of them. D wasn't quite sure about some of the combinations of why colors would be put together. And then basically said, you know, she preferred more of a beige space and, and she would like that somewhere in this space there was some beige because then she said, I know how to, I know how to live with that. And then she paused for a little bit and laughed and she's quite a hilarious person and gave me a gross gesture with her arms. And she said, and 
why would we have these fireboxes there? And I looked and I had never actually seen those fireboxes there. It's, it's interesting how we, you know, even though I'm trained to do this, we can go through a space and not see things the same way that others might. And so I think this is a good representation of, got me thinking about the, the common sense approach that we can bring to a space, but also from her perspective. We don't always think about that. I have yet to find the answers as to why the fireboxes or all of this, this instrumentation is there and can we change it in the next phase? So stay tuned, I might know that answer soon. So the other thing that I think is interesting, sorry that this picture is fuzzy, I carry a small camera tucked in my pocket and whip it out when I can to take pictures and obviously I didn't do a good one with this one, but it is a representation of something that I was able to take notes on. So vulnerable populations um, often will have people who um, stand in and be proxies for them in engagement processes, typically known as most knowledgeable person. And by default, we usually consider close family members to be in this position. But what was interesting as I was documenting the relocation of this particular resident is that, um, and I was overhearing the conversation that was done in terms of between the family members to determine the location of her objects, her possessions, her furnishings in her space, was that they were making decisions um, from their own perspective, from their own positionality. So they were seeing the need to have the furniture laid out for when they come to visit her. And how would furniture be configured in such a way that they could sit around and visit with her? And at no point uh, did they think about, except for the, the placement to the TV, one said, well, she could sit here at the end of the couch and watch TV. What was interesting is that um, I, I'm, in, I'm in this particular space quite a bit um, through the week at different times of the week. And at no point does she ever sit down. She, she's one of our active residents. And um, not only is she hardly ever in a room, she doesn't sit in front of the television in any regard, in any location, in, in any part of the space either her room or the common rooms. And she loves the fact that there are these large windows and she will spend all day traveling from one window to another, looking out, watching both the construction that's happening there, the neighborhood activities, the, the animals, the birds that are in the trees. And she will read all of the signs around um, that could be on anywhere that she could see. She'll read all of the sign that's around her. So the fact that this um, information was not included, it, it's, it's important for us to remember that even though we're working with people who we assume know the resident very well, um, we remember that in fact, they still are humans and they still are approaching um, the conversations that we're having or the information sharing or even the decision-making from their own positionality from their own perspective. And so our, our research team in knowing this, we actually are required to, to undertake continual reflexive exercises as an ongoing process, um, not only to just keep refining and, and reminding ourselves that, that we are subjective humans in this context, but also that um, we are looking at a situation through our own positionality. Um, one of the ways that I can learn about the capacity of individuals to make decisions and their preferred means of making decisions is actually through watching how they participate in different person-centered activities. So I, looking for the level of engagement that they may have, um, the, the, not just um, the range of it, but also are there specific ways that they become more attentive, that they become more engaged, that they become um, more animated or active in terms of exercising any decision-making um, capacity that they have and would like to share. So 
additional when there's when there's context like this so this was a, a, a planting exercise a planting activity where uh, different planters were being potted with um, annuals for the summer I think this was done at the end of the spring um, this this conversation that was facilitated by this volunteer actually uh, pulled out opportunities for more conversations, more interactions. They were able to start off with the common topic of gardening and stretch it out to many more things through the, I'm going to say about a, um, it was about an hour activity that was going on. And what it did was um, expand their level of communication and cognitive capacity for them to be able to articulate many choice ideas um, through the interaction through this. Uh, and it's, it's really, it was really critical to see that the, that the person who's uh, potentially the facilitator in this role is open to and provides permission for the residents to be able to do this. So, the, so some of the participants in this little group, for example, have almost no um, communication capacity. This woman here with her back to us communicates primarily through singing. And yet she was able to articulate many choice opportunities uh, through the kind of interaction that they had. And it was very clear what she was interested in and what, what she was choosing to do at that particular point. And of course, as a material culturist, I, I am fascinated with seeing the role that material objects play in everyday activities. In this case, this woman who's standing, uh, she's not able to construct very much articulate communication. And yet she was going around one day with her wedding photo and she was using it as the means to be able to facilitate conversations and interact with her neighbors. So when we understand, so she did this for a couple of days and, and as I was following her, I realized that this personal object was actually acting as a substitute for verbal language. So she could point to it, she could use uh, specific, you know, individual words, uh, her body talked a lot through all of the kinds of um, uh, the, the responses that she was getting from her neighbors uh, that actually gave us a whole bunch of information about how she was perceiving concepts like comfort and home and safety. And yeah, it was just fascinating to see. The other thing that our research team has done in the past, and we've just started again with this particular project, is we produce uh, several educational films about the lived experiences of aging and how everyday things can be used as therapeutic objects. So in the making of these films, we actually hold about eight to 10 art making workshops with residents in the congregate living communities. And these are really quite informally structured workshops. So we have maybe a general idea, but then, and we have about a two hour window to have it in. But what ends up happening is the art making is the, um, the activity through which we do the work we want to do. And the work we want to do is um, develop some kind of social relationships with, with the residents, the participants of the workshops. We want to be able to um, give them pretty well uh, a context in which they can demonstrate a lot of independent thinking, a lot of choice making. We want to um, see what comes out of that. We want to be able to learn what we can from them. And once again, that, that is usually used as opportunities for storytelling, for more information to emerge about who they are, the context that they're living in, uh, their, their identity histories is a big part of what we want to get to know is who these folks are, so that we can then learn how to program their spaces for them well. Um, they're, they're quite social we focus more on the social part of it and the, and the opportunity for interactions rather than the production piece of making art. So we'll start off the event with 
uh, us facilitators acting as hosts and we serve refreshments and and uh, we 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 almost do like a speed dating thing where we get to know people quickly and then um, after many iterations uh, we we really feel like we get to know folks quite well we uh, take quite a few notes afterwards to be able to document the context of the kind of conversations that we have and then interestingly enough at the end of the process we have a red carpet event where we where we air the film that we made where we invite family and loved ones to also come and see the film and um, we've had instances where family has basically ignored the residents because they haven't known how to interact with folks or, or known, you know, who they are. They feel like they've lost their loved one, and yet we see a we see a whole uh, the residents in a whole new light and are almost reintroducing them to the person that they are currently. And this this um, relationship building really acts as one of the precursor steps for us to then. Um, invite them to be part of some of our more formal research activities that we undertake later on. One of the things that I like to watch, this, the, the renegade in me is quite happy with this. So I love to watch what I think of are forced communal activities, where there's a collection of grown adults that are um, brought together <laughs> into uh, a a, a, a common space to do an activity to do something there's a there's a lot of demonstration in the uh, bringing them together in them being in that space that I see around power dynamics around coercion reluctance on the part of participants there's manipulation bribing what I really love to see is who participates and who doesn't and I'm focusing more on the non-participating people because that's a choice that they're exercising. And secretly it kind of warms my heart a bit because I feel like there's a bit of a stubborn streak. There's some sort of independence that, that folks are still exercising and want to demonstrate while they're in this congregate communal living environment. And they're making the choice to not participate, which we have to see is okay. Um, and those are the folks that I, that I, that I um, tap into later on. I, I follow them as much as I can to find out how else they continue to demonstrate that so that they're not just fitting into a system. They are expressing and exercising their understanding of what their place should be. Um, okay, so in a lot of design uh, projects, the act of prototyping is a really important one. And uh, depending on the, um, the cost of the project, so in this case, we're, we're building, you know, building that's more than 40,000 or $40 million. It's important to take some time to invest in uh, some prototyping activities because that can give us a lot of information. So in this case, there was a mock-up of a suite that was done. And we want to be able to see how some of the initial uh, design ideas actually worked or didn't work. So most industry standards for measurements, configurations are often based on standard human beings. And in this case, we took uh, 10 different residents through the space to be able to see how they moved through the space. Um, this woman is slightly less than five feet tall. And so of course it was important to see how her body moves through the space. And this woman uh, is an example of some of the video work that we did where we were um, documenting how people moved through the bathroom, um, mimicking different kinds of activities that they would do in order to have a better sense about where the the initial ideas about the placement of some of the grab bars and features would actually work for them. And that that's a really great I, in, immediate opportunity for feedback. Because I'm 
this researcher in residence, I hang out a lot in the space. The, I, the model that we usually use in our research group is to actually move into the facility for a significant amount of time. But with COVID, I wasn't able to stay. I'm not allowed to stay there. I'm not allowed to sleep over. So I hang out there as absolutely much as I possibly can. And I'm lucky because um, it's a facility that's really only 15 minutes away from me. So I'm there quite a bit. And I do two things. I'm kind of balanced between lurking in the background, hiding out, and I do strategic things like I have a little tiny stool that I sit on and I tuck myself in the corner so I'm out of the line of sight, eye level of most people, and I become just part of the furnishings in some way, to sometimes interacting with folks. So these, these two women, um, I gravitate to when they're together because they they remind me of the two um, Muppets in the balcony at the Muppet show that were always giving the, the running commentary of what they see around them. So these two can't help but constantly talk to each other about what they see around each other. And eventually in the back and forth exchange they have, which, which uh, reading the transcript might be not very clear, I, I pick up on all kinds of information about what they're seeing in the space. But actually, more interestingly and not, I read their body language because their body gives a lot of way about reacting to things that are happening. So there could be an exchange between other people in the space or something's happening and they are mirrors. Their beings are very strong mirrors about what's going on around them. And so they tend to give me more information than they would tell the staff that work there or the staff might not see it the same way I do um, and the other thing is they I have a little bit of a familiarity with them now so I'm able to interpret like the coded words that they use or the substitutions that they have um, and they've told me all kinds of fascinating things so I really love these hanging out with these two so what time are we at? Perfect. I've provided a, a wide range of examples, I think, for you about how information can be collected for um, understanding individuals' daily living, to see how they express their individual de decision making. And I have learned that I can't be scared to seek out non-traditional means of this learning that this is a non-traditional population who really merits a non-traditional means of, of engagement with them. And every scenario that I can conceive of provides me with very different information that can inform this process. And I'm looking for opportunities for individuals to provide me with this information. So thank you very much. This is me and I look forward to questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much to both our presenters. Um, I think you've highlighted the wide range of topics that gerontologists study. Um, I think it was a really nice combination, but thank you both very much. So um, we do have a few minutes now, if anyone would like to use the chat feature just at the bottom of your screen, if you have any questions or comments for either of our presenters today. Um, if I could ask a quick question or I have a comment. Oh, sure. Anthony must have turned on your microphone. That's great. Yeah, go right ahead, please. Um, so I'm a, I'm a nurse and I do consultations where I go to residences and homes to try to see how we can adjust the interaction with the person to, to alleviate like behavior secondary to dementia is how people always talk about it in the referrals, but like responsive behavior or sometimes it's the communication approach. Anyway, the environment comes up a lot as one of the things we, we tried to look at. So I was really struck by the little stool and you sit on the little stool and then you're like the background. One of the problems I have, especially when I go to a residence is that I'm this outside person and I come in and I have a little clipboard and then I become like a part of the dynamic and then it's so hard to observe what would uh, what would be happening if I wasn't there so I, I wondered if you could tell 
tell me just a little bit, describe a little bit more how you do that and, and uh, what's your strategies for like kind of trying to disappear? Well, um, I think, so I'm thinking of, um, people who I've, who I've witnessed and, and observed in your scenario where they come into an, an, a, a context and immediately everybody sees them. You're not, vis you're not invisible because you're, you know, this shiny new thing. That was the same way for me in the first while when I started hanging around. Um, and I was very aware, actually, not only were, were the residents aware, but also the staff members, they were not clear. But I tend to, um, so I've put in hundreds of hours now in this space. I know that might not be possible for you in any regard, but I try to do many, many things to stay um, invisible in some way. So sitting down lower, not making eye contact. I have a clipboard, but it's like a battered one. I try to, to write and I, and I make it look like I'm writing a story. Um, rather than like, I don't have any forms that look formal or anything like that. I have my lanyard with a tiny little camera on it that tucks in my pocket that I can pull out and I can just sort of out of the corner of my eye, see the screen and I just, I turn off the click and I just can quietly um, take pictures just to remind me then when I come home and I'll write a couple of notes on the page so that when I come home afterwards, it's a it's a cue to then remember a whole scenario that I wanted to. Or if I had there's a conversation that's going on, I'll just note a couple of key words so that I recall what the conversation was between people because I want to note that interaction. Um, and I'll stay for like a six hour window at least four hours, a six hour window, because then I just sort of sit and the people come and go and they eventually I'm just somebody there, right? Um, the, the lousy thing was when folks were moving, the, the folks in the, the relocation, there were tons of people. There were the movers, there were family members, there were all the new staff had to come through and check all the building out. And so I was just one of the other people and I've just sort of remained one of the other people that's around. So it takes time for you to just kind of disappear into the background. I wear boring clothes. I don't do anything fancy. I don't sit with them in the same way. I, you know, tuck myself in here. I will talk to people as I move through the space. Eventually, you know, some residents come up and talk to me. And then at that point, that's a different kind of interaction. It's just a one-on-one, -on -one, a little conversation. It's very, you know, it could be five or 10 minutes. It's very close to the eyes, but I'm not sitting there with my eyes wide open, like watching them in any regard. Great, thank you. Um, I think this one is for Danielle. There's lots of positive comments about both presentations in the chat room. So, um, Danielle, um, could you comment on for the mediation analysis, how you did the sub analysis? Uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, so for the sex stratified analyses, I literally just divided the sample up into males and females, <clears throat> excuse me, and ran the models on male, what, all the models that I showed uh, ran that in males and then separately ran in females. Um, if they were also, I'm not sure what specific subgroup analyses they were referring to, but if they were also um, asking about the different components of allostatic load as the mediator, so that was the entire sample. But instead of using the total score, I just use a uh, total allostatic load score. I just use the uh, subscores for each system. So instead of all 20 biomarkers, I just use the biomarkers that fall under, for example, neuroendocrine. There were four of them. So that would be a score from zero to four and so on. And that's how I did it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, this one, um, I think is for you, Lara. This is from Catherine Freeze. Hi, Catherine. So Catherine's comment is about color choice in public spaces and saying that it's really a very personal preference, what colors people prefer. Um, so do you have any advice on, on suggestions? I mean, we can't have every color represented. So are there ones that are um, more ideal in this setting? So the things that we need to, that we looked at, first of all, were understanding how aging eyesight typically functions for folks. So we, we there's a lot of uh, information around uh, how 
vision processing eyesight works with different kinds of color palettes so we know in terms of contrast in terms of saturation in terms of the amount of actual light that we need in a particular location um, and how that changes with uh, the presence of natural light so that's a whole body of research that we can look at then of course that's compounded with anybody who has um, differing um, eye, eye vision issues and with any light processing challenges that they may have. So layer that in. Then we look at the cultural associations with color. So we know like red is, you know, a, a panic color. Yellow is a bright sunny color. Greens are, you know, nature colors and, and, and blues are calmer. So there's some some gross cultural generalizations that we have with associations with colors. And then the piece that I'm really interested in that we're just starting, which will probably go on beyond my research project, is actually understanding. Uh, so we, we already know from research that people tend to develop their style affiliations with a particular time in their life. And they represent that in their homes at the time when they become, have more disposable income and they can express their identity in their home environments at a particular time in their life. What we want to do as part of the intaking process for, um, for congregate living communities is actually have documented representation of what their homes look like, because then that can help uh, to inform us to say, oh, were they somebody that liked a really busy house, like lots of stuff around or not so much stuff? How did they represent seasons or events during the year versus not? Uh, did they sit at a dining room table that was separate from their kitchen or was it all open plan? you know or did they eat standing up over the sink like we don't know these things yet and they're often not included in the intake process when we get to know people but this profiling now we're realizing is an important part of then making sure that we're developing and programming spaces that are their home as opposed to just these sort of multifunction abstracted ideas that don't quite fit for anybody Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you very much. We are out of time. So thank you for both for your wonderful presentations. There's lots of positive comments there in the comments about them. So um, and thank you all for joining us. We will be um, having a, our next um, webinar will be on February 17th. So hopefully we'll see you at an upcoming webinar. Thank you all. Have a great day.